Hi, everyone who's already online. Um, I might just start so that we can get to our speakers. So, um, yeah, good, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We have a global audience uh, at today's Institute Conversations webinar. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Brendan Harney. I'm a PhD student at the Burnett Institute and Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. I'm also the vice chair on the INSU AMCR Special Interest Group. So INSU Conversations, this is our, uh, our second webinar. Um, we had our previous one in September last year. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for joining. Um, while we do have a global audience, I would like to acknowledge that I personally am on the lands of the Bunurong people um, of the Kulin Nation, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to thank uh, very much the people uh, or organisations who have provided funding to our uh, INSU EMCR special interest group. Uh, these are the Burnett Institute, where I'm based, Bristol University, Glasgow Caledonian University and the Kirby Institute. I'll now like to hand over to my co-host Kennedy. He'll introduce himself and our first speaker. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kennedy Kwechmutai. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bristol. My area of specialization is on infectious disease mathematical modeling. Um, currently, I'm in my final year of my PhD and I'm a member of the INSU EMCR SIG. And uh, so, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Wendy Masterstone. Uh, Dr. Wendy is a lecturer in criminology, specializing in substance use at the University of Stirling in the UK. She's part of the Salvation Army Center for Addiction Services and Research and the Scottish uh, Center for Crime and Justice Research. She holds a PhD in sociology and social policy from the University of Stirling which was the development of a realist informed intervention framework for green space programs for improving mental health and supporting people with problem drug and alcohol use. Wendy's research interests include realist methods, substance use, harm reduction, mental health, health inequalities, and the health benefits of green space and green space interventions. So uh, welcome, Wendy. Uh, take it from there and give us um, your presentation. Thank you, Kennedy. Um, let me just share my screen. Is that working okay for everybody? Yeah, grand. Okay, um, so as Kennedy said, my name is Wendy Masterton and I work in the University of Stirling. And I'm gonna to present today on building a realist framework in three phases. So. The, for the first part of this presentation, what I want you to do is go over some of the key phrases and terms that you hear within realist methodology, and also to consider one of the main questions, which is why use realist methods in the first place. So to begin to answer this, um, one of the key points I really wanted to communicate here is that a weakness of your traditional experimental evaluation is that it often remains unclear why an intervention is um, is successful or why it works and how the desired outcomes are actually achieved. So because understanding and evaluating an intervention was key uh, within my research, that is um, that guided my decision and why I wanted to use realist methods. Um, just because the premise of realist methods is that they explore why programs work rather than simply if they work. So through this process, I was able to develop what are referred to as program theories. And this is a key term within realist research. And I'm going to be coming back to, to that term a lot throughout my presentation. But very simply, these are really just theories about why a program or an intervention work. And every intervention is made up of a number of these. So realist approaches really hold that outcomes in complex interventions so within um, health interventions public health interventions are they are achieved through what is referred to as underlying generative mechanisms and it's these mechanisms that are said to be present in the right context and this relationship is referred to as a context mechanism outcome configuration and I know that that sounds quite jargony but it's just simply that the mechanisms 
within the right context lead to outcomes. So it's a little bit like a jigsaw um, that all the pieces fit together and provide this full picture of the intervention. So I don't want to spend this whole talk talking about the definitions, but I do want to consider what we actually mean when we talk about these. So the context of an intervention is the environment in which it happens. So this doesn't necessarily need to be the physical environment. It can also be things like the cultural norms. It could be participant characteristics, could be economic conditions, geographic elements, um, could be previous experiences. It could be the policy landscape, for example. And then within the, these contexts, the, the intervention happens and then the mechanism are the parts of the intervention that the, the participants respond to. So this is usually an emotional response or a cognitive response. So sometimes referred to as a hidden response um, and, and, and that's what is referred to as the mechanism. And then the outcomes are or the effect is the unintended or intended measurable outcomes. So now that I've given just a little bit of the definition work, and like I said, I'll come back to these um, these terms quite a bit through the uh, through my presentation. But I wanted to explain how I use this approach to build a framework for nature based programs that support people with poor mental health and with problem drug and alcohol use. So just to provide a little bit of context for my uh, for my work, green space and mental health is a really rapidly growing area now. So research has explored the relationship between green space and, and mental health in lots of different domains. So, for example, subject to well-being, depression, anxiety, self-esteem, bipolar, schizophrenia, among others. And a highly cited study by White and colleagues found that people who spent at least two hours a week in nature were consistently more likely to show higher levels of health or report higher levels of health and well-being compared to people who spent less time in nature. And what was important or one of the things that was important about this study was that this idea of a two hour threshold was present for all groups. Um, so those that included those with and without a long term illness and, and disability. So nature based interventions, nature based programs or green space programs, uh, these terms are, are used interchangeably. They've been presented as uh, potentially a promising addition to health and social care. And um, as well as programs for mental health more generally, programs like wilderness projects and adventure projects, conservation projects, care farming, garden projects, among others, have also shown real promise for people with substance dependence. However, while there's an increasing number of these programs being developed, there is actually still really quite limited understanding about, um, about why they work and what the key components and processes are which make these programs successful. So without this knowledge of um, why they work, it's really difficult to build interventions um, and uh, particularly for different population groups. So uh, a better understanding will hopefully hopefully facilitate this but it can also increase um, engagement with programs it can increase interest in programs and it can also increase buy-in from stakeholders and, and people that are referring to service users onto programs as well so thinking again about this need to know why an intervention works using a realist approach to explore these underlying processes appeared to be the best route for uh, for what i wanted to do so the first stage of my work was a real synthesis. So this can really be described as a type of systematic review, but it's got a slightly different focus as I've, I've explained a little bit on this slide. So the first stage of a real synthesis is building what are referred to as initial program theories. And the researcher does this by reading literature, having initial conversations with stakeholders, and generally just build assumptions, which are referred to as these initial program theories about how they think the intervention works. Um, and remember that the program theories are these the, the theories that consist of contexts and mechanisms and outcomes. So essentially, as I said, these these are sort of hunches. These initial program theories are hunches about why you think the intervention works. And then once these have been developed, then evidence is gathered systematically through the, the searching of literature. And this will then allow the initial program theories either to be accepted or refined or rejected. And it's through this refinement of program theories that research can build an explanatory framework um, of an intervention based on existing evidence. And this ideally um, allows a far greater theoretical understanding of the intervention process and why it's successful and for whom and in what circumstances. So this development of initial program theories is, is not often discussed a lot in the literature. Um, and I found it quite difficult when I was doing my, um, my review. 
um, as a as a novice to realist research. So I wanted to discuss here exactly what I did um, to, to do this. So the first thing I did is read a lot of literature to get a feel about why programmes appeared to be successful. I highlighted papers with these emerging themes on my EndNote library, although you could use software like Envivo, for example, if you prefer using that. Um, and I highlighted and documented when there was a context, when there was a mechanism and when there was an outcome discussed, particularly if it was clear that a mechanism was leading to an outcome or if a particular environmental aspect was important too. So again, thinking about the context that interventions are happening in. Once I had these emergent themes and potential initial program theories, I had lots of conversations with the rest of the research team. I also had lots of conversation with program staff, really just to see if they think if they thought that the um, these hunches made sense. And I also read a lot of evaluation documents and other grey literature that was available. So we came up with eight initial program theories. These were split under the themes of nature, individual self, so changes within an individual self and changes within the social self. And I've just provided three examples here, one from each of those in, um, overarching themes. But just looking at the top one, so in relation to the nature theme, so the context was related to the green space environment itself, but also within that, it, there needed to be an ease of access to that, um, to that environment. And then the mechanism that I proposed was that within that context, within the environment, that the, the, the service users would feel calm, they would feel uh, feelings of escape and feel removed from their everyday life and stressors. And this would lead to the outcome of decreased anxiety and decreased um, stress. So after this development of the initial program theories, they were tested, like I said, systematically going through the literature as you would in, in a traditional systematic review with search terms and specific inclusion exclusion criteria until there were the final included studies. And these final included studies were the ones who were most um, effective for supporting or refining the initial program theories. And if the literature did not support the theory, if we couldn't find that theory um, in, the, in the literature, then it was rejected. And I just wanted to put the search process there up on the slide so that you could see how similar it was in, in terms of process to a traditional um, systematic review that you may have done or, or may have read. So the development of the initial program theories into seven refined program theories I've illustrated here on the Venn diagram. So the titles of the program theories were decided as being the most accurate overarching description for the theory. I'm not going to go too much detail uh, about what they what they mean um, because I cover them a little bit later, but it's just important to understand that it's the combination of all these program theories that explain the successful intervention. And within these program theories, as I've said, there are a number of contexts and mechanisms and outcomes. So for anybody uh, that wants to read a little bit more about this review, um, it's published now and I can send it to, to anybody who wants to read it in a little bit more depth and read about the program theories and the development of them in a little bit more depth. But just to give you an example of what a program theory consisted of within the review, um, and again, how the components work together, I've written out the self-efficacy example here. So the availability of the trained and confident facilitators was the context in which the intervention was um, was working, as well as the program resources and the funding landscape that was um, that was necessary. And then it was the increased feeling of empowerment, which was the mechanism when learning new skills that was said to be important. And through this mechanism of empowerment, then skills knowledge increased, which was the outcome. And again, this this um, the the user's self-efficacy was another mechanism that um, that was important in order for them to implement the new skills in the life outside of their program. So that was um, another outcome. And then we also identified that a person's previous experience, as well as their realistic anticipation or realistic expectations of anticipated challenges was a, a personal individual level context that seemed to be um, important as well. So now that we had the program theories from the realist synthesis, what happened next? So another key part of realist research is retesting theories with new data. And so in a sense, realist research is really about continuous refinement um, in new environments or new interventions um, or with new data. So I wanted to move into testing the theories with primary data. So the first way that I did this was by creating a survey. So I explored lots of different components, so all the different components of the framework that I, I mentioned in the slide before, and I sent it to programs that supported people with poor mental health and with problem uh, drug use and alcohol use. So this allowed me to see that there was a really high level of agreement overall with the proposed framework and um, that I developed in the synthesis. Surveys are actually not often seen in uh, realist research a lot, but I, I found it was quite a helpful exploratory step. 
again, because Realist Research is about iteration and, and testing and retesting. And I really wanted to test mine in quite in a, a larger scale than is sometimes possible in interviews. So um, I sent it to a number of different organisations that were uh, working on the ground and across a range of different people as well, just to explore the general consensus. And um, like I said, you, you typically want a variety of steps in um, in realist research. So a survey could be a potential step, particularly if you're then wanting to do a little bit more in-depth quality of work, which is what I was doing, um, which is what I was doing with my uh, with my work. So this is just a visual example of the responses from the program theory uh, around physical activity. So just one of the program theories. So you can see that the survey statements down the left hand side with the letters showing if they were context mechanisms or outcomes within the program theory. And then the bars show the general agreement with the statement. What's really helpful is when you analyze data like this is that you can visually see that there's a high level of agreement overall or if not. Um, so where you can see where people disagree, then you can see that that's maybe where you want to delve into the program theories and think where they might need refined. So as I said, this is only one graph, but there was a number of other graphs um, with the other program theories. So we were able to see where the disagreement was a little bit more and um, and take that forward to the next step in terms of um, informing how we de design the questions and the, the qualitative component of the work. So now that we had the program theories tested using primary data on the survey data, um, from, from the survey, we had some idea about the sections that needed refined and explored further. So that's when this quality of work um, came in. So a key objective of a realist interview compared to other uh, quality of interviews is that it's not designed to gather participant narrative. Um, it's just it, it, the, the purpose of it is to conduct um, or to test hypotheses. So Go, like I said, these are the program theories. So you want to test the program theories, again, refine them and uh, in response to the emerging data. So I conducted qualitative um, telephone interviews with staff on green space programs, with researchers and wider stakeholders within the field. And um, I found that the semi-structured interviews were really effective in testing the existing theories, but also flexible enough to allow identification of the um, any additional context, mechanisms, and outcomes um, for program theory refinement. So I interviewed 17 uh, participants across two stages. So 12 of the interviews were completed in stage one. These were a bit more exploratory and the program theories that um, I had going into this phase from the survey and the, the synthesis were tested and refined in light of the emerging stage one interview uh, data. And then this allowed the refinement of the interview schedule in preparation for the second stage. And this second stage was more discussion around consolidating the program theories to try and finalize them. So it's worth saying as well that because of the work in the realist synthesis and the survey study, there was not much need really for numerous exploratory interviews as um, as there might be if this was a first phase. So some people will go straight into using interviews um, to build their initial program theories rather than doing a, a synthesis. And that's totally fine, but you would probably need more interviews um, at this stage if you were wanting to be a bit more exploratory and try and build initial program theories uh, by using interviews first. So this was the final framework developed from all the phases, in particular, the qualitative phase. So it's a little bit small, probably on your screen, but in the black rectangles down this, the left hand side, you can hopefully see the overarching themes of uh, nature, individual self and social self and that they, they still exist. And the program theories, the next block along, have very similar names to the Venn diagram you saw earlier. Um, this is good. It means that there is lots of support for general theory ideas and you can see how the context mechanisms and outcomes fall within the program theory names along each row of the table. So while you're looking at this, I'll just give a very brief overview of why the findings are important. So in traditional substance use treatment, changes within an individual, so things like feelings of purpose, um, increased self-efficacy can be seen. Same with changes in social self, so reduced feelings of isolation and improved relationships. But the top program theories um, under nature is really where green space programs can provide what I refer to as additional aspects. So this idea that a person can escape and get away from daily, stress, um, daily stressors, even if um, only briefly. Also, having space to reflect was described as, as particularly important. So feeling the physical space to reflect on their lives. But it was also a psychological feeling as well. So having space outside rather than confined within traditional treatment rooms. So this appeared to really improve the likelihood of people engaging with the treatment program and reporting reductions in power imbalances in comparison to the usual doctor and patient environment. 
So through this quality of work, we were able to refine the framework. Firstly, unsurprisingly, the work happened during 2021, 2022. So COVID was a real challenge. It described as a real challenge. But it's important to highlight that the framework is flexible. So if you were using this framework for future implementation, the COVID program theory could be removed without detriment to the rest of the framework. And then in relation to intervention approach, explicit pro focus of the program was said to be essential in order to make sure that staff with relevant expertise were on the program to support people, uh, to support the service users. And then finally, clear aims and objectives of the program were necessary for stakeholders to understand why a program was worthwhile. But this was mediated by the funding landscape itself. So again, this is published and I can share this um, the framework and the quality of findings paper if you want to read about it in a little bit more detail and see the framework um, situated within the context of the study. But just finally, I want to talk very briefly about the implications and strengths of freelance research in the context of my study. So the findings of my work complemented recommendations found um, in reports relating to green space and health, but to truly incorporate green space programmes in healthcare um, provision and for diverse groups of people, such as people who, um, who use substances, then there's a need for sustained investment and uh, particularly from wider stakeholder stakeholders and more secure funding and only through understanding of programs can this happen. Secondly, realist methodology allows evidence from different disciplines to be combined together. Um, there's a lot more focus on interdisciplinary ways of working now and realist approaches allow this evidence to be drawn across different disciplines, theories and methodologies. And thirdly, the number of times that the programme theories were refined in the project um, using data from multiple stakeholders from different countries as well means that the, the framework is potentially more convincing compared to approaches where only one programme theory or logic model is developed. And then finally, findings have the potential to be relevant outside academia for those um, developing interventions by providing recommendations on how programs work and why. And this can be used to optimize, uh, tailor and implement future programs. And just finally, it's important to acknowledge limitations as well. So realist methodology is supported by guiding principles rather than standardized rules. Sometimes it's referred to as inherently interpretive and subjective, but there are ways of addressing this and ensuring transparency. So, for example, putting a your protocol on Prospero for, for a realist synthesis, um, ensuring clear description of any design process. So, for example, we did that with the survey design process. We had continued conversations with the wider research team and stakeholders, and we also kept detailed memo boxes and, and detailed descriptions of the refinements um, of the program theories throughout. Of course, one of the biggest challenges is when do you stop? Because Realist Research has no concrete endpoints, its program theories can always be refined. So a decision must be made at some point as when um, when you're, you're going to stop data collection while acknowledging that there may be program theories that you haven't thought about. And then thirdly, many Realist projects are years long and um, they often have really large teams working on a single project. But this wasn't an option for mine. So again, it must be acknowledged where the limitations were there and um, and how much data I could collect and analyze. And then finally, um, the decision about outcome measures has been described as a crucial aspect in uh, in realist research. But it, um, it can be quite tricky to navigate how to um, decide which outcome measures to include and um, how to tease out short term and long term and, and midterm outcomes as well. I would say that sometimes outcome discussions are not given as much as attention as uh, exploring the context and mechanisms, given that they better allow you to understand the why question. So it's really important to think about what outcomes you're actually interested in exploring. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions in the final part of the session. Um. Thank you so much, Wendy, for the great presentation, well captured. Um, it's fascinating to get to know all about uh, the pitch that you've made about a realist method. So thank you so much. And um, to the participants, we will be taking the questions after we've uh, done with uh, both uh, our today's presenters. And so um, it's now my singular honor to um, usher in our uh, uh, next uh, second uh, presenter, who is none other than uh, Dr. Binta Sultan. Uh, Binta is an uh, NIHR doctoral research fellow at the Institute of Global Health at UCL. 
She's also a consultant physician in inclusion health in London and chair of the National Clinical Network of Sexual Assault and Abuse Services at the NHS in England. She supports teams which include experts by experience to deliver outreach healthcare to socially marginalized populations across London and advocate for more integrated, inclusive and effective strategies and policies for socially marginalized populations. She's completing her PhD fellowship a mixed method realist evaluation of hepatitis C outreach models of care for people experiencing homelessness in England. She uses co-produced methods and work alongside live experience researchers. So um, welcome, Binta. The floor is yours. Thanks, Kenneth. Um, thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to try sharing my slides. Um, so... Apologies, tried this earlier. Okay, can everyone see those? Great. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to switch off my video just because my internet's sort of cutting in and out. Um, I can. Right. Um, so thanks everyone, and it's been wonderful to hear from Wendy, um, and thanks for sharing your knowledge. So I'm quite early on in my realist journey, and I'm gonna share some of my work and hope we can have a discussion and I'm gonna learn some things too. So I am undertaking a um, mixed methods realist evaluation of hep C linkage to care, uh, linkage to treatment for people experiencing homelessness, and it's been an iterative journey for me. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of background as to why this is an important subject. We know about hepatitis C and um, the main risk factor in England is um, from injecting drug use. And there's been this revolution in diagnostics, as we know. Um, and there's a lot of complexity that's come uh, about because of this and including high cost drugs, the political environment of austerity and rising drug deaths and, uh, of course, the COVID pandemic. Um, I'm now going to talk about hep C in the context of homelessness and then talk about the realist evaluation and how we got there. Um, I'm using the European definition of homelessness, which includes street homelessness, people in temporary accommodation and sofa surfing. Homelessness is an extreme form of exclusion and social deprivation, and it differentially affects racialized sexual and gender minorities with diversity of experiences. The levels of homelessness in England are rapidly rising and it's associated with high morbidity and mortality. And there's this bi-directional relationship between homelessness and substance use, with substance use often preceding homelessness. And Joanne Neal described the double jeopardy of homelessness and substance use. And people who experience homelessness experience multiple barriers to care. Um, we have systems and policies that also exacerbate stigmatizing experiences through the criminalization of homelessness and drug use and other forms of structural violence, something that Ruth Wilson Gilmore refers to as organized abandonment. So homelessness is the visible manifestation of a series of life experiences that lead to deep exclusion. The services, systems and policies associated with hepatitis C and homelessness include economic health, housing and criminal justice. They're complex and they interact at multiple levels. Um, so the pandemic, as it did for everyone, caused a rupture in my thesis plans and I was redeployed to COVID frontline, which greatly influenced my perspectives on, on my PhD and the study that I was doing. I'd originally planned to do a small trial looking at the feasibility of using point of care testing for hep C RNA for testing for current um, infection. That was no longer feasible because you couldn't um, implement a trial um, during COVID. Um, point of, the diagnostic had been uh, become routinely used in the service and also my role had changed and um, what had changed is that I had now become sort of a, a clinical and strategic leader working in the space um, and it provided me an opportunity to build relationships with stakeholders and, and hepatitis C commissioners um, as well as um, trusted relationships with patients and an understanding of the complexity and challenges of their daily lives. I became more than just an, an sort of outsider researcher and it provided me with an understanding of the complexity of systems and organisations involved in health, health and social care. 
And it led me to an understanding that I needed a different methodological approach to the study, one that could manage and evaluate the complexity inherent in the nature of the problem. And I've already explained some of the compl complex nature of the problem, and there's complexity at the level of the individual and the context within which they interact as well. And this quote is from a paper that's greatly influenced me. So it um, says the most significant aspect of complexity possibly lies not in the intervention per se, but in the context or setting into which the intervention is introduced and with which the intervention interacts. And I think realist methods of a realist approach really try, allows us to try and understand some of that complexity and how it affects outcomes. Um, so the research question for this study was about how do we optimise delivery of hepatitis C outreach models of care for people experiencing homelessness to improve hep C linkage to treatment? And this can be broken down into how, how and why do they work and what are the underlying contexts and mechanisms that lead to success or failure of these programmes? Um, so to use this, I've, I've used the realist evaluation cycle and it, this provides um, a structure to the evaluation. It enables development, um, building and refinement of theory. Um, stage one is the elicitation of initial program theories, as Wendy spoke to. Stage two is the development of methods and field study design and data collection. Stage three is the analysis. Stage four is synthesis. And stage five is refinement of theories. And throughout this process, there's a continuous refinement of theory and eventually the development of a theory that is at a higher level of abstraction that provides a causal explanation as to what works for who and why. And the realist evaluation um, cycle provides the, the sort of study design um, for this, which is a mixed methods convergent study design. The diagram shows the three phases of the study on the left, which correspond to the realist evaluation stages on the right. Uh, phase two relates to the refining of theory through field study, design, data collection and analysis. And I've used case studies, one were located within a service that I was working in called the Find and Treat service. And the other is an um, outreach St Mungo's uh, homeless uh, hostel service. And I've used realist interviews of stakeholders um, and patients accessing the service, as well as ethnographic methods using observations and quantitative data on um, linkage to hepatitis C treatment and outcomes. And I've developed program theories for each of these case studies. And in the final phase, which is the refinement uh, stage, I'm synthesizing these program theories. Um, so the, a large uh, portion of this work is uh, co-produced and there are two main ways that people with lived experience have contributed to the study. Um, there are peer researchers involved with interview data collection, as well as the scoping review and analysis and synthesis. And I have a community advisory group consisting of a diversity of experiences of homelessness, drug use, hepatitis C, gender and race. So case study one is a peer and clinician hep C outreach model of care in London with this peer and clinician who go out uh, twice a week to various bits of London and see people both on the street as well as in um, hostels and drug services. Case okay, study two is a homeless hostel based hepatitis C testing and linkage to treatment led by St Mungo's hostel teams. So this outlines the case study design and the methods used and key to this has been my role as an embedded researcher and I've had to use rapid ethnographic method, methods of collection in order to finish this work on time to be able to influence policy and to finish my PhD. Um, it was really important to have a theoretical framework to guide this work because of the, the complexities, I found it really useful. And I'm using the candidacy framework to build and develop theories and as a framework in um, the scoping review. Uh, candidacy was developed by Mary Dixon Woods uh, to conceptualize access to um, care for vulnerable populations. And I'm also using the socio-ecological framework uh, to capture the different dimensions of context that can activate mechanisms and influence outcomes. Some of the findings from the initial scoping study. So I did a, an analysis, a survey analysis of national data among people who inject drugs. Um, and it showed that almost 80% of people experience homelessness and that this is increasing with almost three times the odds of hepatitis C exposure in those experiencing homelessness. 
um, undertook a scoping review, um, which showed that there's been a lot of newly published data in the last couple of years, um, but that there was a lack of data around the diverse experiences of homelessness and how it, it affects um, hep C treatment initiation rates, a lack of understanding about what are the different components of interventions, a lack of clarity about what is context and what is part of the intervention, and a lack of information about why interventions work. So um, we uh, put together a, a significant number of program theories through the initial scoping study, and we managed to consolidate these down to um, uh, 23 initial program theories. And these are just examples about some of them, which included peer support workers role, the rapid, rapid diagnostics um, and um, integrated outreach services. And what we did is prioritise these programme theories um, through stakeholder discussions and discussions with the community advisory group. Um, and we um, whittled them down to the role of the peer support in the hep C outreach models of care for people experiencing homelessness, integrated outreach models of care, and intersectional needs for hep C outreach uh, in outreach models of care for people experiencing homelessness. So these are just some of the quantitative results, um, uh, which shows excellent progression through the cascade of care. So this is from the peer plus clinician with almost everyone completing treatment. Uh, just some key sort of findings about the background uh, context. There's no explicit program theory of how some of the, these programs worked. There was an iterative development of programs. Um, there was committed and passionate staff, but not enough funding, but um, senior leadership support uh, at national level and peer support workers were key in both programs of work. Um, in order to really understand and break down the, the kind of context mechanism outcome, um, which I'm going to describe some of the program theories in just a second, um, what I did is I broke down, I used this concept from Sonia Delkin um, to disaggregate the mechanism um, concept to mechanism which is both a resource so what you're kind of providing and reasoning so the, the, the people's humans response to that resource um, and some key contextual uh, findings um, were that at policy level public discourse and unrestricted access to um, hepatitis C treatments were important considerations of improving treatment rates, institutional culture was important at service level, and mistrust of services and stigma influenced individual interactions. Um, some key themes that emerged from the findings so far were around trust, collaboration, cultural understanding, uh, limited resources motivation, legitimacy of roles, and rapidly changing environments. So this is an example of a program theory about integrated outreach care. So that's providing, um, uh, thinking about providing care beyond just hepatitis C treatment. Um, and the context is that health teams go into homeless settings such as ho hostels. Mechanism or resource is that they're witness to living conditions and additional needs, which they wouldn't see otherwise if they didn't do that outreach work. Um, and the response is that they are address and advocate um, for the person to meet those housing and social care needs. Um, and what this does is reduce the number of competing priorities that people have to deal with and improves engagement in hepatitis C treatment. So that's just an example of um, one of the CMO configurations. Uh, another is around um, peer support workers. Um, and so um, looking at how um, peers are, are seen as legitimate members of healthcare teams. So that's the context. Um, that leads to them feeling empowered and confidence to take time to build trust with patients and relationships with patients. The response, the mechanism and response is that time taken to build trust and use a flexible um, approach and that continued contact. And this is a quote from one of the peer support workers within the program and it's, uh, it reflects this, which is this, he said, a consistency with love. Um, and what that re results in patients trust um, the peer support worker and engage with hep C treatment when they're ready. And at the bottom there, I've just kind of related these to the different stages of the candidacy framework that I mentioned earlier. So that's around kind of uh, getting through to services, identifying um, people as candidates um, and helping people navigate services as well. 
Um, just a final CMO that I'm going to discuss, which just really shows how an outcome from a program theory can become a context for another. So this final outcome was the context for the previous program theory, and it's something that's called the ripple effect. Um, so the context is if um, peers are employed by a third party who's responsible for them, um, senior leaders feel able to advocate for their inclusion in hep C healthcare teams, leading to destigmatization of them as people. And the response is that clinicians, including nurses and doctors, feel confident to embed peers in their hep C services, leading to further destigmatization, and peers are seen as legitimate members of their healthcare team. Um, so this is just um, so, sort of some uh, consolidated findings around peer support workers. And it appears that trauma-informed care, which is that um, banner across there, appears to be the main mechanism by which peers are able to navigate people experiencing homelessness through care and driving th them through these various stages of candidacy. Um, and then this is just one of the sort of final program theories, it's still a work in progress, but um, uh, it says that peers within the hep C elimination program in England transform the experience of healthcare for people experiencing homelessness through the practice of trauma-informed care and a shared cultural understanding. This enables people experiencing homelessness to navigate hep C pathways of care, leading to an increased state of candidacy for the patient, resulting in them better able to negotiate access to care from them for themselves through an internal recognition of their health care needs and through a sense of hope of seeing peers who have similar life experiences to them in positions of responsibility and through positive health care interactions leading to reduced fear of accessing services. It's very long, but it's um, a work in progress, as I said. And i just leave you with this. Um, thought about considering um, the, what approaches work for you and for me the realist approach worked really well um, and and kind of addressed all the sort of help to address some of the complexity in this work and I'll stop there. Great thank you so much Binta and thank you to Wendy as well uh, too fantastic presentations on realist methods, both, you know, substance use orientated, but uh, obviously very uh, different um, topics. So, yeah, really great to see the work you've done. And um, as someone who's also done a PhD during COVID, I uh, somewhat feel your pain. Um, so we have about 15 minutes for questions. So also thanks both of you uh, for keeping to really great timing. Um, this is called Conversations. So if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to pop your hand up and put your camera on, ask the question, or if you're a bit shy, you can pop it in the chat. So far away, hopefully we have some questions for our presenters. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to both speakers. Uh, um, the presentations were really informative. I was wondering if uh, either of you could speak a little bit about policy impact. Have you Do you have any experience in using realist uh, evaluations, realist synthesis uh, to, to shape policy or practice? I can, um, I can go first. Um... I think one of the benefits of using realist research or realist methods um, in my experience is that, and I went over this in my presentation and, and Binta did as well, is that just that understanding of why programs are working opens up conversation a little bit more or makes conversations a little bit easier. So um, there, I, I think specifically in terms of green space and nature-based interventions or nature-based programs, it there's this understanding that yes nature is good for you but there is little understanding of why that might be and from my experience when I've spoken to um to different people particularly for example in the homelessness sector um there are uh, there are organizations that I have spoken to who have implemented their own programs based on uh, on some of the work that I've done 
um just sort of grassroots stuff but um the i've found that the conversations that you can have because you can break it down really simply into this is why it's happening like this is how the outcomes um are are achieved and these are some of the contexts that are really important to think about that it allows people to understand how to implement even very small scale changes uh, within their um within their practice particularly for areas that they can acknowledge might be beneficial but they wouldn't necessarily have much experience in so for example incorporating a garden based project in um you know in a uh in a sort of temporary shelter or, or uh, temporary accommodation for example so i've certainly seen the benefit of using this approach just in how you can communicate findings and how you can explain how your findings might actually well, how they might look in practice Right. Thanks, Wendy, and thanks, Elena, for the question. Um, we have a question in the chat from uh, Jack Wallace. Um, I don't know if you want me to read it, or it's for the first one's for you anyway, Wendy. It's about nature having different meanings for different people and cultures, and if, if you can expand on um, researcher subjectivity um, within realist methods. So this is a really interesting question because it's not an easily answered question because um, as part of my PhD, actually, I wrote a large chunk of my chapter about how the um, how green space is so poorly defined within research. And actually, there has been a couple of reviews where uh, one in particular really found that half of all the papers included didn't actually define what they meant by green space or nature. So you can imagine that that has consequences in terms of when we're talking about green space and talking about nature um what i did was that i um i defined green space and defined nature at the start of my interviews the start of my projects any um any uh, paper that i wrote within my um within my thesis as well i was really clear about providing my interpretation of um of green space while acknowledging that it was only my subjective experience. I mean, my um, and my background obviously shapes how I think about nature, how I think about um, how I think about green space and think about its effects. But um, I, within the interviews, particularly, we had discussions around how individual aspects and culture, for example, um, might impact the might be an important cultural uh, might be a, a, an important cultural context. Uh, within why an intervention is successful or not. So that was something that I really invited participants to talk about and thinking about why green space programs or nature-based programs might be might appear more beneficial for um, one population group, but actually perhaps it's a contextual issue, so a sort of like ease of access or um the like relationship with the people with the um with the program providers for example that could impact it and may maybe having a uh, influence that we're not necessarily seeing just from the first visualization so it's a really important question it's a really important consideration and um yeah it's something that the the researcher has to be really um tuned in about and um and utilize their kind of reflexivity around to ensure that their own like any quality of research um the to just be aware of how your own experiences are are driving the research All right thanks wendy and thank you for the question jack um there's another question also from jack in the chat um for binta um but i will touch on it in relation to wendy as well after this so if you've had a chance to look at it uh binta but basically jack's asking who the peers were in your work um in terms of you know we're talking about hepatitis c injection drug use and homelessness and while they overlap um you know not everyone will necessarily have all three of those so if you can just touch on what their experiences were and what kind of support were offered to these people um and jack touches on how it can be challenging for people in terms of their own personal history yeah absolutely and it was a key consideration for me um throughout this project um to think about the safety and well-being of um, the peer researchers within this. Um, and so one of the ways I managed that was I um, have peer researchers, peer researchers who are already working within an advocacy organisation. So I have peer researchers from the Hepatitis C Trust 
which is a peer advocacy organisation, and Groundswell, which is a homeless health peer advocacy organisation. And what that does is provides a framework around them um, for support, um, uh, access to psychological support, and they have regular check-ins um, with their teams, uh, which is already kind of part of their routine work. And also I have reg regular check-ins. Um, there has been a turnover of the people within the group, because of um, people's recovery journeys. Um, and that's something I was very aware of, but I felt that the best way to kind of um, uh, minimize uh, any sort of negative impact on people was to use those sort of frameworks of, of people who were already embedded in organizations and had that structure around them. Right, thanks, Minta. Um, so, the question, so um, Pinterest work obviously included peers. I was just wondering, Wendy, um, while yours was more the kind of, I guess, the um, the, re the synthesis, did you, you mentioned people working in programs, but did you include or were there any kind of, I don't know, consultations with people with lived experience of mental health illness or substance use or both in the work you did? So, um no and the reason um the reason why there wasn't was because i conducted my data collection during sort of the periods of lockdown um and so that significantly impacted my ability to collect data from different um different groups in particular the uh, because i would be needing to go to nature based or or um green space programs these were either um stopped during the lockdowns or when they started to reopen again they were opened with really really strict um numbers and if i went onto the program then that would take the space from somebody uh to to somebody who was using the service so these were ethical considerations that we had that i've spoken about quite a lot in the in my thesis um it was a difficult decision to make but it was um it was one of the only ways that we uh, we could continue with the research that we um, that we wanted to do initially we really wanted to have lived experience in the in the heart of the project so what we're actually doing now is that we've been um we've been granted uh funding from the uh from the chief scientist office uh to continue some of this work and actually the the project that we're doing now it's a two year project where we're um where we're speaking to people with lived experience, both in terms of a advisory group, but also going onto programs now that they're all opened up again, um, and working directly with them so that they are able to refine the framework and that their voice will be central to the um to the work. So this is what I'm saying about research realist research being iterative and just um you you can take the framework, but you can always refine it. So what we're doing is basically taking the framework, the this sort of finalized framework from my PhD, but then testing it with um with people who have experience of of substance use and then refining it in light of what they are saying. So by the end of the project, we will have a finalized framework that has got the voices of not just the staff and the and wider stakeholders, but people that are actually on the programs themselves. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, that does actually segue perfectly into another question I had, but I'll just see if anyone else has any questions, comments. Kennedy. Um, thanks once more, um, Wendy and Binta. My question goes to Binta. Um, how complex does it get when you wish to incorporate more than one outcome uh, say, for instance, in a uh, setting in which I work where hepatitis C and he uh, HIV infections is really high, um, if you wish to incorporate, say, hep C, HIV, and mental health, how complex does it get uh, in terms of realist methods? Hi, Kennedy. Th thanks for the question. Um, I think uh, there's... It's complex anyway. Those, as you say, you know, the people living with those individual conditions will have um, complex needs anyway, and combining those things can be difficult. But I think there's there's an inherent complexity in everything that we do, and I think the way that you manage that complexity is by really being having some clarity around your research question 
um, and what the purpose of your research question is and who the um, who you want to impact as well in terms of your research question. And I think all of those things can give you a bit of clarity. The other thing that really, really helped me was having a framework that I use to guide me so that every time I reached a, a, a kind of um, a, a place where I felt confused, if I went back to the framework and I said, how does this fit here and what decision do I make next? That was really, really helpful for me. Um, and I would um, advocate using it. And I and I wish it was used more in, in sort of more quantitative work as well, because I think it's a really valuable tool. So that's how I kind of overcome, overcame some of that complexity. I think whatever you do, there's going to be complexity. If you dig down and deep into really understanding things, there's always going to be that complexity. So I wouldn't um, let the idea of people living with multiple conditions um, put me off trying to understand um, more about things that could uh, influence their health outcomes. Thanks. All right, thanks. Um, we had a question in the chat, and I see Wendy's answered it. Um, so what I, and you kind of touched on it, Wendy, have you, so clearly you've got, you just mentioned you have received some funding. So I'm assuming you used everything you did on in your PhD to support that was it a funding application? I guess what my question is, you know, we kind of get told that, you know, a, an RCT or, you know, whatever is, you know, the kind of gold standard. So the broader question was, have you used, you know, um, applied for funding specifically saying, I am going to use realist methods because A, B and C. Um, so I'm assuming you have in your case. Yeah, so... um the project that we've got funded is an intervention development project as a um, and, and feasibility acceptability study. So it's kind of it, we phrased it as a stage before the RCT. Now, what we we really did and, and how we developed the, the funding bid was the um, or the, the grant proposal was that we really drew heavily on the MRC NIHR guidance for developing um uh, complex interventions so this paper and I can share that as well um, in, in the chat afterwards if people haven't read it because that is certainly here in Scotland that's the um, the guiding at the moment the, the guiding uh, document that that is really that that peer reviewers are going to look for within a grant application for this type of work to see that how you're drawing on that document to uh, to form your proposal within that document the uh, they speak about realist research as being one of the the key parts of developing program theories so program theories are used a lot as a term throughout that and um the 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 thought behind, um, I guess, their guidance within that document is that you should be using realist research and that particularly in, in development of interventions and that you should be consulting with stakeholders and that you should be um, and uh, that you should be talking about context and the, uh, the importance of context. And actually, when I was uh, going to some of the information sessions on that grant proposal was uh, they they said that if you didn't talk about some of these things, it's very unlikely for your grant to be um, successful or your uh, proposal to be successful. So I spoke at length about the um, about realist research and why it was the uh, preferred method of what we we're wanting to do, and spoke really clearly about how it fitted into the different phases um, and stages of intervention development. One of which later on can be a pilot IC, um, RCT, but the acknowledgement that you need to do work before you can get there. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, let's see what's going on. I had another, what's the time? Sorry, got a check. We are cutting it a bit fine. Liv, do we have time for one more question? One more um, question. Okay. Where are, the question is, where are the key popula population types in your sample population, if so, how effective do you think this intervention would be to such populations, considering that key populations are discrete and have stigma challenges? So not sure who that's directed at. Probably could apply equally to both, but Binta, you did definitely touch on stigma. Um, I might let you 
have a crack at that question. That's okay. Um, so the question is how effective do you think would be to key populations? So this was a this population was um extremely marginalized, so people experiencing homelessness and people who use drugs essentially. Um so extreme forms of marginalization. Um and I think the findings hopefully would be relevant to other populations who do also uh, uh, experience this extreme form of marginalization um, there's a lot of things around stigma absolutely and stigma from healthcare services in particular that people experience that I think the findings speak to in terms of trying to do better yeah right thanks Binta yeah I think if you decide to the most marginalized then hopefully it can be applied to people who are less marginalized in theory anyway um, so with that being said, uh, we have come to a conclusion. So I'd like to uh, thank both our presenters, Wendy and Binta, for sharing their, their realist uh, methods with us. Um, it's been great. So if everyone give them a round of applause, uh, thanks so much. Um, so, yeah, that's basically the end of today's webinar. Um, so for I'm sure most of you know about INSU, but if not, I'm just going to pop the link in the chat to our EMCR group. So... Um, if you're a student, joining INSU is free, um, and then you can join our EMCR special interest group as well. So thank you once again, and uh, have a good evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Thanks, everyone.